Hi guys. So when we're making measurements in class, we want to we want to remember that a measurement is a number with a unit. So make sure that every time you do a calculation and you get an answer that you also include those units. Okay? So again, all measurements must have units. So these are some examples of units. These are all of our SI base units. So SI stands for Système International. Um, and this is kind of like the universal language for science. So with measurements, we're going to have two types of measurements. In science, we're going to have qualitative data or qualitative measurements, which are words such as heavy or hot or maybe um, using colors or identifying there are several or a few. And then we've got quantitative measurements, which are going to involve numbers, right? Quantitative sounds like quantities and they're going to depend on the reliability of the measuring instrument and they're going to depend on the care with which it is read and this is determined by you so we want to make sure that when we are doing uh, measurements in lab that we are being very careful and that we are being very accurate um, with our measurements so now that gets me to accuracy and precision Accuracy. I said that when we were doing uh, labs and we're doing experiments, we want to make sure that we're being very accurate. So what does the term accurate mean? The term accuracy means how close the measurement is to the true value. So let's say uh, we were measuring some blocks and the blocks measured one gram. And when you did your measurements, you said that they came out to half a gram. You're not exactly being accurate, right? Because you're not getting what the actual measurement is. Um, so then our next term is considered precision and precision is how close the measurements are to each other in other words um, how reproducible they are okay or reproducibility so in other words if you keep measuring that block that we said is one gram and you keep getting 0.5 and 0.5 and 0.5 that means that you're being precise you aren't being accurate right you're not getting the right answer but you are getting the same measurements and your measurements are being close to each other again and again and again Okay, so both of those are very important techniques that we want to have. We want to try to be accurate as well as being precise. So here we've got some examples. Okay, so in our first one, um, we've got some arrows right here. And we've got a whole bunch of arrows that have not hit the target, right? So since they're not hitting the target, right, our target's here in the middle, um, they're ne neither being accurate nor precise. They're not hitting the target and the the arrows are not hitting the same area okay so in our next example we've got precision right all of our arrows are hitting the exact same area um, in the target but again they're not accurate they're not hitting the bullseye our last one all of our arrows are hitting the center of the target and all of our arrows are together so this is considered precise and accurate and that is our goal right so we want to make sure that we are doing measurements the same um, every time and we want to make sure that we're doing them correctly so then in this example which ones do you think are precise and which ones are accurate okay so in our first example here do we have precision and yes, we do have some precision, but we have no accuracy, right? In this example here, we're not hitting the target, but our arrows are close together. That's precision. In our second example, we have got our arrows all hitting the target, and they are all together. That means we have precision and accuracy. And in the last one, we do not have either, right? We're not hitting the target and none of our arrows are hitting the same area okay so none of these are precise or accurate so when we do measurements there is going to be some uncertainty so measurements are performed with instruments right we've got some sort of tool that we're going to use to do these uh, measurements and no instrument can read to an infinite number of decimal places so which of the balances below has the greatest uncertainty in measurement and I'm looking for something that has the least amount of decimal places and that's going to be our one here in the center okay so when we are doing labs if we're using a digital scale a balance if I have three decimal places then I want to make sure that on my paper I am writing all three decimal places I want to make sure that I am including every single number that the scale gives me because that's going to tell me how accurate I am going to be able to be with my answers so when we're measuring, um, we're going to have significant figures in measurements. 
Significant figures in a measurement includes all of the digits that are known plus one more digit that is estimated. Now let's say that we're looking at a digital scale, right? A digital scale is going to give us so many numbers. Say it's going to give us three numbers or four numbers. And we said that we're going to write down every single number. Now I can't estimate anything because there's they're not giving me any more information to estimate with. Um, but if I was using a triple beam balance, the triple beam balance would give us certain markings and I would be able to estimate at least one more digit. Okay? So significant figures are going to help to account for the uncertainty in a measurement. And again, I want to use all the numbers that I can and I want to try to estimate one more just so that I am being as accurate as possible in my calculations. So on this uh, ruler here, to how many significant figures can you measure this pencil? So we're going to go ahead and look at the pencil and our pencil is measuring out to about here, right? Um, but the markings, we've got a 7. I know what this marking is right here. That would be 7.5. Um, and I can estimate one more. So somewhere in this area, right, if my pencil landed somewhere there, I would be able to estimate at least one more number. So here are rules for counting significant figures. This is going to help you out with the worksheet that I gave you guys. So first thing we have are non-zeros. Okay, Anything that is not a zero is always going to count as a significant figure. So in this example, we've got 3, 4, 5, 6, right? In other words, 3,456. This number has four significant figures. Okay, So every single one of these numbers are significant because they are non-zeros. Okay, now when it comes to zeros, this is where we get to, it gets a little tricky. Okay, so zeros, leading zeros do not count as significant figures. In other words, zeros to the left of anything that is non-zero. So the first significant figure in this example would be the 4, and then I would count everything after it. So we've got three significant figures in this case. And again, leading zeros do not count. These zeros here to the left don't count. Our next one says that captive zeros always count as significant figures. In other words, zeros that are sandwiched in between non-zeros, right? I've got this zero here is between a 6 and a 7, so that's going to make this zero significant. So in this case, we've got four significant figures. Now, if I have trailing zeros, in other words, zeros at the very end, they're significant only if the number contains a written decimal point. I have to literally see that decimal point in the number. If the decimal point is not written in the number, in other words, they didn't give it to me, then I cannot count those trailing zeros. Okay, so trailing zeros, zeros at the end, only count if the, if the decimal place is actually written. I can actually see it on my paper. So this example here has four significant figures. Now, there are two special situations where we have an unlimited number of significant figures. The first one is when we have counted items. So whenever I'm counting things, such as 23 people or 36 de desks, then I have an infinite number of significant figures. And if I have exactly defined quantities. So I know that 60 minutes is equal to one hour. So let's go ahead and look at these. So here we've got uh, some examples. So we've got 1.0070, and remember we said that zeros that are sandwiched are going to be significant, and then zeros that are trailing are significant only if I can see that decimal point in the number. So this one has five significant figures. Right, next one, we got those trailing, that trailing zero again, and I can see that decimal place, so we have four significant figures. In this next one, we have sandwiched zeros, and I have a trailing zero, but I'm not counting this trailing zero because I don't literally see the decimal point. Okay, if I literally see the decimal point, I would have seen it drawn right there, right? It's not there, so then this trailing zero is not significant. The next one, whenever I have a number in scientific notation, which we're going to look at next, I will only look at those uh, numbers before the time sign, and those ones are what I'm going to take my significant figures after. after. I'm going to go ahead and ignore these, so don't even worry about these. Okay, here we got another one. We've got leading zeros, and we said leading zeros are not going to be significant, so I only have two. And in this next example, we've got a whole bunch of trailing zeros, but again, I don't literally see my decimal point. Remember, if 
if I don't see my decimal point, I'm not going to count these trailing zeros. It doesn't mean the decimal point's not there. I know the decimal point's there, but because it's not written, I'm not going to include those zeros as significant figures. Okay, and then our last one, we've got three cats. And again, because this is used to count something, this is going to have an infinite number of significant figures. So our next one we have is scientific notation. So this is the back side of your worksheet. Really easy to do. So scientific notation is a method used to write really, really big numbers or really, really small numbers. So a number in scientific notation should be in the form of m times 10 to the n. Okay, I will always have a number times 10 to some power. My m has to be a number between 1 and 10, and my n, my exponent, is going to be a number that indicates the number of decimal places moved, and this may be a positive or a negative number. So let's go ahead and try this number here. Okay, so the first thing that I want to do is I want to um, place a decimal where I can get a number between 1 and 10. Okay, so in other words, I've got this big number, 340,000, and I am going to place a decimal somewhere in this number where I can turn this number into a number between 1 and 10. So where would that be? That would be right here. So if I put my decimal place right here, then that is giving me 3.4. Right? My decimal place goes there. That's 3.4. So then, if I have my number that is a number between 1 and 10, right? We said we were going to put our decimal place there. Then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write times 10, and the power is going to be how many times I move the decimal place from its original position. Okay, so in other words, I've got 3.4 times 10, and my power is based on where the original decimal point was. So in 340,000, my original decimal point was actually at the end of the number, right? A, a decimal place is always at the end of the number if it's not written on the paper. Just like a period is always at the end of the sentence. So if I count the places moved, I've got one, two, three, four, five places. Which means that I would go ahead and write my exponent as a positive five. Okay, so it's my original number is a number that is greater than one then that means that my exponent is going to be a positive number. Okay, let's try another one. So in this example, where would I place the decimal point? I need to get a number between 1 and 10. So if I place my decimal point right here, I end up with a number that is between 1 and 10, right? 5.21. So I'm going to go ahead and write 5.21 times 10 and then we said that we're going to count how many decimal places we moved. So originally in this number, my decimal place is right here. It's given to me. And I moved one, two, three, four, five, six places. So I'm going to go ahead and put a six. And we said that I have to look at the original number. And my original number, right, this number right here, is a number that is less than one. So that means that my exponent is going to be a negative number. So what if you have to round off due to significant figures? Then all you're going to do is follow the rules for rounding. Okay, so let's say that I need to change this number, 256,000, into scientific notation, and I only need to keep two significant figures. Well, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to go ahead and place that decimal point where it belongs. So I'm going to put the decimal point right here. That's going to give me a number between 1 and 10. And then, since I only need to keep two significant figures, I'm going to go ahead and keep, I know I'm going to keep two numbers, which means that I'm going to keep the two and I'm going to keep the five. But my rules say that if the next number is greater than five, five or greater, I'm going to go ahead and round up that last number. Okay, so my last number is going to end up being 2.6. Okay, so we got 2.6 times 10. How many places did I move the decimal point? Originally, it would have been at the end of the number. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And since this number is greater than 1, we're going to keep this as a positive number. So there's my answer.